Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I've got a sort of portfolio career. This is halfway towards retirement, but I'm busier than ever. So what is haemovigilance? It's uh, defined as a set of surveillance procedures covering the whole transfusion train from the collection of blood from the donor and its components to the follow-up of recipients. So it's intended to collect and assess information on unexpected or undesirable effects resulting from the therapeutic <coughs> use of labile blood products and to prevent their occurrence or recurrence. And in the UK, we've got two organisations. SHOT was started up in 1996 because haematologists and others had concerns that more adverse events were happening. Thank you. More up than were being reported, uh, particularly ABO incompatible transfusions from mistakes. And of course, at that time, there was a lot of concern about transfusion transmitted viruses. Haematologists and others wanted to write guidelines but didn't have any evidence to base that on. And so SHOT grew really out of, out of that and it takes reports from right across the transfusion process, but not about donors. And then in uh, 2005, the European legislation came on board and the MHRA is the competent authority with responsibility for looking at uh, quality, really, in laboratories and blood establishments. So these are complementary systems. They're never going to do the same thing, but we're working towards harmonization so that we're talking the same language. So SHOT's uh, mission, really, is to improve patient safety by improving the standards of hospital transfusion practice to inform policy within the UK blood services, and I'll show you how that's happened. There have been several different types of guidelines that have been able to arise out of this and other evidence, and there's been a very extensive educational programme with a lot of different aspects that's really grown out of the shot reporting over the years, including um, national audit programmes. So there are 15 years of uh, experience now. It was initially voluntary confidential reporting system and so only a small number of people participated because at that time people were rather scared of reporting ad adverse outcomes. We're, we're learning to try and do more of that and it was a voluntary but now several of the quality schemes require hospitals to do reporting to SHOT. It's part of the um, CPA requirements for labs for example and it's now web-based so it's much easier to collect the data and um, every year we have a symposium which is on July the 5th this year in the Lowry Centre and we publish a, um, an annual report, which I'm currently in the middle of writing for last year. We're funded by the UK transfusion services, four of them, that's Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and England, and we don't report on donor events. So over the uh, decades, participation's gone up. So when this originally began, do we have a pointer? Yes, we do. Yep, um, only 22% of organizations reported a very small number of reports, but by, Last year, we've got 98% participation and a much greater number. But I want to draw your attention to this, that every year, about a third or more of the reports we guess are near misses. They're events that could have gone on to cause catastrophes, and I'll show you something about those. But it's very good. 98%, it's very odd that we've got eight hospitals with quite big transfusion activity that don't report anything. We don't believe it. And so if we look at the cumulative data, I'm sorry this is a bit small, but we collect um, if, reports about cell salvage. Uh, there isn't really autologous transfusion as it was understood. Transfusion transmitted infection, transfusion associated graft versus host disease, which has disappeared, post-transfusion purpura, acute transfusion reactions, that's a biggie, about 30%. Transfusion related acute lung injury, which is going down for reasons I'll explain. Hemolytic transfusion reactions, Transfusion-associated dyspnea, a rather ill-defined category. Transfusion-associated cardiac overload, which I'll come back to. And then a whole raft of mistakes. Mistakes with anti-D, <coughs> mistakes in handling and storage. Transfusions that were inappropriate and unnecessary or delayed. And this big one here, incorrect component transfused. Okay, so we have the so-called physiological or pathological reactions, that, which is why you watch people when they're having transfusion, because they may not be predictable. So you shouldn't go away, leave them without watched. And then there are some in the middle, and it might include some of these, where it, they might be preventable by improved practice and monitoring, especially transfusion-associated circulatory overload. And then there's a big group, which is about half all the reports, which is adverse events caused by mistakes. So if we look at the progress over the decades, we can see that at the beginning we had a small number of reports, but 12 deaths from transfusion. The number of deaths has gone down, but it hasn't disappeared in the face of um, an increasing number of reports, which is good. 
And so if we look at the percentages, in, in the early days, a third of everything was deaths or major morbidity, whereas now it's only 6.6%. So we're getting more reports, but fewer serious events. So we've had a reduction overall in the, in the mortality and major morbidity, which means perhaps it's an effective system. People are reporting what's happening. There's certainly been an, a reduction in ABO incompatible transfusions, but they still happen. There were 12 last year. Those are all potentially lethal events that shouldn't occur. And uh, it's on the Department of Health list of never events, and it, it shouldn't happen. I'm very alarmed to tell you that the NHSLA are thinking of taking transfusion off their risk list, and that's because there hasn't been much litigation. But it's certainly not, we're not at all happy. Because sadly, where are we now? We're still back to basics. Mistakes are about half of all the reports are shot every year. And the reports that are made to MHRA are also related to human errors, people not follow, following basic procedures about the patient. So it's quite simple, really. You have to identify the right patient and label the sample correctly. You have to make sure the laboratory is performing the, the, the correct procedures and choosing the right component to issue. And then it needs to be given to the right patient. And you'd think that we can all do that properly. But oh, no. And part of it's because we make assumptions. We assume that the person who did the thing before us has done it right. And that's happening all the time. Assumption is a very dangerous word in medicine. We have to make some, but we shouldn't make more than we have to. And in 2006, the National Patient Safety Agency, which is disappearing, produced this safer practice notice and really required all trusts to try and induce tra introduce training and competency assessment and to make sure that at the time... The, bit, the place where you can catch a lot of mistakes is at the bedside. Is this the right patient and the right pe um, unit? Not checking it against the case notes or the compatibility label or by the bed number. All of things which are reported because it might be wrong. And uh, these are clinical incidents of wrong component transfuse. It's not very many, but they're still happening. And every one of these could be a very serious problem. Um, and it hasn't changed all that much since, since the introduction of the SPN 14 notice. This is a cumulative uh, graph. I just want you to get the size of it. Um, these, are, these are sort of stacked up what the mistakes are. Um, wrong components, inappropriate handling, inappropriate and unnecessary transfusions. And then at the bottom, the blue bars are the incompatible ABO transfusions as a consequence of that. This is special requirements not being met. That's mostly not giving people irradiated products when it's indicated and so on. But th th we're not getting rid of all these mistakes that are happening and we shouldn't be too complacent. And if we look at wrong blood in tube, this means that the blood in the tube isn't the blood of the patient you think it's from. And we look at 2010 and 2011, we've only had here three incorrect components transfused, or five in 2011, but there's a hundredfold increase in the events that could have happened because that's the number of near misses where it's been identified before the patient was cross-matched or before the unit was given to the patient. So quite a high incident, and it may be actually that there's an even greater number because this has got a certain definition that may not include. It means ones that have got as far as the lab, not ones where they recognized on the ward they'd taken it from the wrong patient. So it's a warning, really. And I just want to give you an, um, an example. Um, this was a cardiac patient, so I thought it was topical. Patient A, blood group O, was transfused two units of group A positive blood. That's the one you don't want to do because the, his antibodies, um, anti-A, reacting with these units of blood. That's the scenario for renal failure, death, and all the rest of it. So on arrival in ICU, he got two more. And it was following transfusion, he actually had evidence of hemolysis with an inappropriate fall in hemoglobin. Another reason why your post-operative hemoglobin might fall faster than you think. A rise in his uh, bilirubin, he had to have a complete replacement transfusion. And he had a more extended stay in ITU because of renal dysfunction, but he survived. And then uh, when we went into this, the two patients were sampled at the same time in a preoperative clinic, and the nurse got distracted while bleeding the first patient and transposed the samples, didn't complete it at the bedside, and then patient B's mislabeled sample was detected because when it got to the laboratory, he had a different group historically. But patient A had no historical group, so there was no way of picking us up, so he got the incompatible transfusion. So one from the same incident, one's a near miss, and the other's a potentially lethal event. So one of the things that's absolutely key is making sure that you've got the right patient. And even in outpatients, you can call for Mrs. Smith 
and somebody else thinks they've heard their name and they come into the clinic and if you don't check you've got the right patient sitting in front of you, you might have the wrong one. And the most uh, extreme example of that that I know was a patient who came in and appeared to have lost, uh, gone from 80 kilograms in weight to 40, I exaggerate slightly but you get the idea, um, in a few weeks. And the doctor said, oh, Mrs. Smith, you've lost a lot of weight. But of course, it wasn't the same patient. So we, um, it's dangerous to make assumptions. We're trying to encourage patients to make sure doctors and other people in the clinical scenario know who they are. And um, I'm, I'm becoming a believer in checklists. I've recently read the checklist manifesto. manifesto. We've put together a transfusion uh, checklist because people are not doing the checks. So just to move on to the pathological reactions, the ones that may not be preventable, and I just wanted to illustrate a few of these, that transfusion-associated GVH has been pretty much eliminated by leukodepletion, even though we, we, can calc we have 780 patients over the last decade who didn't get irradiated products. None of them have got uh, this disease, which was prevalent before leukodepletion. And transfusion-related acute lung injuries related to female donors giving plasma or platelets because we ladies who've had babies have antibodies. And that's been largely, it's certainly been reduced by moving to male donors. And bacterial infections in platelets, which was something emerged from the studies of SHOT, has been reduced by, by the transfusion system altering the way in which they um, obtain the blood with diversion of the first 20 mils and a different kind of cleaning of the skin. So just to show you that Trali, the Trali cases that were reported in the early years were definitely associated with FFP and platelets with that kind of increased odds ratio. And then I think this is, yep, this is where the change in, in decision to use donors occurred. And they're still occurring, but you can see the numbers going down. These are suspected cases, and these are the number of deaths. It's a serious complication that we're trying to avoid. And then uh, transfusion transmitted infections, viral infections, we haven't seen any for more than six years. That's to do with the good processes in the, in the blood donations. And we can say that blood transfusion is very safe, three million uh, components issued per annum, but we're seeing a changing pattern of harm, not only the mistakes, but transfusion associated circulatory overload, inappropriate or unnecessary or delayed transfusions. And these now are the, are the things we're picking up as major causes of preventable deaths and major morbidity. And here's the, the graph for transfusion associated circulatory overload um, with this number of major morbidity and deaths every year. And some of the deaths from transfusion associated circulatory overload are because somebody's had an inappropriate and unnecessary transfusion. And it's a particular risk in patients over the age of 70. This uh, distribution of age is quite different to the median in all our transfusion reported episodes. Little old ladies or little old people do not tolerate having units of blood. And often the median time of transfusion for these per units, 1.5 to two hours. So they're getting it too fast as well as too much. Inappropriate, unnecessary and delayed. 12 incidences of delayed transfusion, one of which caused death in 2011, but quite a lot of inappropriate and unnecessary. And the national comparative audits that look at platelet transfusions, blood transfusions and FFP are giving us a lot of information to feed back to clinicians about comparative use and what, as you were seeing in the last talk, why do some hospitals transfuse much more than others for the same procedure? Erroneous sample, of course, uh, taking the sample from a drip arm Wrong blood in tube, I've mentioned. Point of care testing, we've had a couple of instances where in theatre, the anaesthetist said to the ODP, please get a, a haemoglobin result, and they've come back with a result, but actually it's from the glucose machine. So this is about quality of care with your point of testing. Blood GAN acid analyzers are not necessarily calibrated to give you an accurate haemoglobin, and the NEQAS system for haematology is going to introduce a quality assurance scheme for that because we know that you use them but you can get some misleading results. And then tr the other things, tr laboratory errors and transcription errors where people write down the haemoglobin when they mean the, right, the white count and vice versa. So education is a really important point. We made this point in the SHOT report in 2007 and it's not just about competency, it's about making sure people have the knowledge that underpins the competency. Um, because people know how to do it, but they still make mistakes. And we're looking at the transfusion medicine, the curriculum in, in all the specialties, because we're worried about the level of education. Continuity of care is another issue. Um, 
handovers, patients getting handed over between areas of the hospital, between shifts, between day and night shifts, and the messages not getting passed on. And it seems to me that it, more and more often people are not reading the case notes. So even if you write an instruction, nobody reads it. So what about the future? Well, I think it's absolutely essential that we, we collectively have continued vigilance because we can learn from it. I think a transfusion checklist would be helpful, and um, I was talking to the president of the College of Anesthetists who suggested having something that you could pin on the side of the um, anesthetic machine that had the list of things you should do before you give blood, a bit like you have surgical checklists. I don't know what you'd think of that. We are introducing the lots of mistakes with anti-D, which doesn't really concern this audience, but you know, wherever we humans can make a mistake, we will. Monitor adverse events from new treatments. Should we be doing this as shot? Should we be looking at adverse events after PCCs? Because nobody's collecting that data. Nobody's collecting um, possible adverse events after fibrinogen concentrate, which you've already mentioned today. Would you report them on the yellow card scheme? Would, that wouldn't really work. And it wouldn't go through the UK Haemophilia Doctors Association because they're not being used for that. So we're wondering about whether we should do that. And we're going to, we're changing the structure of our report slightly because we think we're talking to ourselves a lot of the time. Lots of transfusion people read the shop report, but do you read it? But you might be more interested if I came to you and said, okay, in cardiothoracic surgery, this is the list of incidents that occurred in 2011. And so I'm now starting to break it down and look at it by specialty because I think that's, you'd be more interested. Uh, so I think hemovigilance is effective. We've, it's improved transfusion safety in a number of very practical ways uh, we, and all the things that have grown out of, out of it. There is a reduction in prevent, preventable deaths and some improved practice, but we're not really satisfied with it. And we certainly would, you know, we would have new plans to go, to go forward. I welcome any ideas that you have. And so, of course, this is not particularly my work. I've only moved into this in the last six months and find it absolutely fascinating. And these are some of the people who are responsible for analyzing the reports. Helen Allen analyzes the pediatric reports. And Hannah Cohen, who's a consultant hematologist in London, has been a, a very important influence. And Lorna Williamson, who's the head, the medical head of the N NHSBT, that was really their idea to start it up in 1996. So thank you for your attention. David, carry on. You go first. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, David Chang from uh, London, Ontario. Um, and, and enjoy your summary. We have the same similar challenge uh, with the shot. In Ontario, we have um, the government, uh, as I indicated earlier, sit on the blood advisory for Ontario, overseeing all the blood utilization. The wrong tube in blood and the inappropriate transfusion is one of our challenge. Um, in Ontario, what we have to try to impress upon the um, division of surgery is that what we have done is uh, every three months we generate a detailed individual cardiac surgery, vascular surgery, uh, thoracic surgery, spine surgery, transfusion rate of each surgeon, submission into, categorized into their bypass operation, valve surgery, hand it back to the chief of the division and ask them so that they have peer pressure to change their practice when so-and-so claim they have such a high transfusion rate when they have similar referral base doing bypass strict or bypass, they internally have to fix that problem. So we, we achieved some milestone in, in changing physician behavior is one of the challenge for making changes. We still have challenge though with the wrong blood in tube uh, because we found out the majority of those places are in a very busy hospital area like in the emergency department in the ICU setting when the patient is unstable, or when they have two patients coming in from, from, uh, from the OR, one is crashing, the other patient on the other bed is trouble, you ask for blood, that's where the mistake. Yeah. I don't know how we can do that. Uh, we are looking at the uh, barcoding. We haven't reached that yet. Do you have experience with barcoding and is that a good thing to do? There's certainly been a very strong recommendation to getting away from the human beings and using um, IT systems wherever possible. Uh, they're expensive, so they haven't been taken up across the, the hospitals in the UK in, in the way that the transfusion people would like. The other problem with them, though, is people then get overconfident in the IT systems and they, or they override them, so that's not the perfect solution either, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. Could I just ask one final question? And this is really why uh, I think it's great that you're here today. 
because as a practicing cardiac surgeon, I have never completed a hemovigilance report or reported it to our transfusion specialist, simply because cardiac surgery, almost by definition, excludes the diagnosis of trali, taco, TAD, uh, pyrexia. There's always a caveat in these, in these definitions that, uh, you know, where a cardiac cause or any other possible cause like cardiopulmonary bypass can be, has been excluded. So in actual fact, hemovigilance is not something that we're really aware of in mm, cardiac surgery mm. because you can always say, well, they had a big operation, that's why they're not breathing very well. It's a good point, and actually, it, 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 within our classification of the pathological reactions, with the, with the lung-associated ones, Charlie, Tad, um, and th that whole group, there's quite a lot of discussion and movement of the, of the reports between the different categories because it's very difficult to tell. And we rely a great deal on the information we get from the reporter, which may be one step removed from the, the clinical scenario when it came. But we hope that you would still notice when your patient had hemolysis from an incompatible ABO transfusion. Yeah. But I take your point. But I think that's, I mean, to, to take an example from Helen's own practice, it, in the neonates, we're not sure what a transfusion reaction looks like. So Helen's part of a, a study, set it up really, to look at neonates and, and monitor, see if it's something different you need to monitor in them. Yeah. So I think there's, there's room to think about that um, and, and maybe even compare between hospitals. Okay. One last question, yeah. Um, we spend a lot of time getting irradiated blood for what we perceive are high-risk neonates and in fact have been known to delay lists when we haven't got the appropriate product. Should we stop doing this? Is it a waste of time now? It's not up to me to say, of course. <laughs> the, uh, I, I, did a, I did a presentation uh, the day before yesterday at the British Society of Hematology just drawing attention to the number of missed irradiated um, products because it looks like leuka depletion is very makes it very safe, but I don't think the the blood national blood services are going to go that far because in their quality assurance about leuka depletion and the number of lymphocytes I don't have the data but they don't guarantee that one or two units don't slip through with more lymphocytes than they should have, and so I think it's a balance of risks. I mean, when you say infant, you mean infants with de George syndrome and that kind of yeah. thing, or, yeah, or unknown, you know, infants with truncus abnormalities or. Because I suspect most of those, and I'm speaking without representing anybody except myself, I suspect most of those don't. And it was when I was at paediatric hematologist at Old Hay, it was the same thing. Do we or don't we? And um, maybe that's, you know, that should be a subject of some other, or maybe we should have, have a look. We haven't had many of those sort of things reported, though, have we, Helen? No, I mean, there, yeah, there are missed radiation, but, yeah. Not but nobody's seeing, thank goodness, transfusion-associated UAG. The problem is that that's a lethal complication. And so if you have one because you missed it, it would be tragic. And I don't know what other countries do. I'm going to find out next week. <laughs>